So this quote actually comes up later on in the text, but I think that it's important for the current conversation. Um, so Van Manen writes that the phenomenological method consists of the ability, or rather the art, of being sensitive sensitive to the subtle undertones of language, to the way language speaks when it allows the things themselves to speak. This means that an authentic speaker must be a true listener, able to attune to the deep tonalities of language that normally fall out of our accustomed range of hearing, able to listen to the ways things of the world speak to us. The world is no mere conglomeration of mere objects to be described in the language of physical science. Whoever wants to become acquainted with the world of teachers, mothers, fathers, and children should listen to the language spoken by the things in their life worlds, to what things mean in this world. And I think that this um, quote is particularly important when we're thinking about our choice of language. So if we appreciate that language is more than a communicative device, but that language creates worlds, what kinds of words um, does your topic of inquiry call for, and what kinds of worlds will the language of your inquiry make possible? So there's definitely an intentionality in the use of language in phenomenological writing. So thinking about a word and its etymological significance is also very important in, in a living inquiry. Um, so the concept of inquiry and the words we use to enliven our inquiries don't emerge out of a vacuum. Um, inquiry does not exist in a place of neutrality or of pure novelty. These moments that we're attending to are deeply rooted with ongoing histories that inform how this moment is lived. And this is where a word's etymological significance is important in your interpretation and um, description of these experiences. Um, these words have histories and their histories matter in daily life and they shape the worlds in which we live. So when we're thinking about inquiry topics such as hospitality, story, beauty, and so on, we're going to also consider the etymological history of these words. So this week, um, there will be an etymological sources forum in week four on Moodle to help bring some of these words to life and their histories. So consider your topic of inquiry, for example, time, wisdom, beauty, compassion, courage, story, or hospitality. Look up the etymological origins and meanings of the word. Consider another language and translation of the word. Uh, you might choose to find this out from a friend uh, or somebody who's a first language speaker. List and look up related words. List and consider sayings and phrases. And after you've done this, write a three to four sentence reflection on your interpretation of the word. And then post it into the week four Moodle forum. So interpretation or making sense. When we're thinking about methodology and living inquiry and also pedagogy, uh, something that um, is important to consider is that both of these things, methodology and pedagogy, can be something that's enacted in the moment and in the making. Um, so Van Manen writes that the insight into the essence of a phenomenon involves a process of reflectively appropriating, of clarifying, and of making explicit the structures of meaning of the lived experience. He goes on to say that making something of a text or a lived experience by interpreting its meaning is more accurately a process of insightful invention, discovery, or disclosure. Grasping and formulating a thematic understanding that's not rule-bound, a rule-bound process, but an act of free seeing. So he's very much saying that these interpretations are situated in the lived experience and situated in the structure of meaning within those lived experiences. Um, but with that said, I think it's important to also note that this experience is not without tension. And I'd argue that seeing is never a free act as we arrive with particular ways of seeing formed through ongoing historical trajectories. But what I think that Van Manen is trying to get at here is that when we're thinking about the processes of inquiry, this is not something that's a predetermined step-by-step -step method, but more so something that's enacted in the moment um, of a living experience. So in the feedback of many of your portfolio assignments, I spoke about paying attention to the internal structures of meaning. So the ideas and meanings that are not on the surface of an experience, that are not only 
descriptive, but rather um, how you might experience and interpret and share your experience by identifying the thematic phrases, main ideas, significant concepts to help guide the search of meaning, and how you might gather a collection of words or phrases that describe aspects of the essence of something. So for example, rather than just describing dancing from um, sort of a surface approach, try to attend to what makes dancing dancing? What is specific about dancing? What is the underlying structure of dancing that makes it what it is? There's a particular essence there. So the whatness or the thatness of a thing, it's very much situated in the event, in the process and the experience rather than on relaying exactly what happened. So to do this, you might choose a word or phrase that synthesizes and expresses significant moments or ideas within the text. So metaphor might be helpful um, in composing this kind of meaning. So to do this, you need to somehow get inside the experience. The process of creating interpretive textual accounts brings the experience to life and in such a way that recognizes um, it's recognized as a possible experience, not necessarily the ultimate experience or how this thing is always experienced, but rather one possible interpretation. So there's an effort to get close to the meaningfulness of the experience, and it's very much a poeticizing activity. It's interpretive. It's beyond merely descriptive, but it's richly descriptive in ways that are not always literal. So in some of your feedback for portfolio entries one and two, I challenged you to write a poem or write in a way that is poetic and um, not necessarily describing the series of events in a, in a sort of surface way. And pay attention to how the quality and the use of language matters in um, your ways of telling. So if in your inquiry, for example, you're thinking with the concept of time, you might want to begin by gathering sayings such as time flies, being in and out of time, running out of time, wasting time, spending time to help you get a general, um, not a general, but a particular sense of the essence of time. So last week, um, Karen Myers, in the article that we read, she writes, language unveils its omnipresent nature as the medium through which we think, express ourselves, and interpret the actions and utterances of others. It's the spoken, the unspeakable, and the silences of the unsaid. And I think this last sentence is particularly important as we think about the languages that we use to um, think through a living inquiry. So beyond written language, what other ways might you elucidate the story of a lived experience? There's so much more that happens beyond the written or spoken word that affect us. So think about how you might consider the unspeakable or the silence of the unsaid as a language of inquiry. So thinking with artistic languages, um, in particular, the language of photography, the languages of photography, is one way to cultivate a message in ways which attends to the essence of the experience beyond words. So thinking about photography in and as research, we're taking a view. So there are perspectives and ways of seeing, but we are choosing a particular perspective and way of looking. So photography as research, um, asks us, how will we look at or enter into this? What am I looking for today in this particular moment? And what will I focus on? So you have to begin and look from somewhere and arrive with a particular intention of what you might choose to look at. As we've described or as we've discussed um, earlier in the course, you do not come at research from nowhere or from within a vacuum. As a photographer and as a researcher and teacher, you'll actively make choices about what you're looking at and how. And these choices are informed by your perception and your perception is thus grounded in a particular way of viewing the world, an act of seeing. Um, so you will need to articulate an initial orientation um, and though you're hopefully arriving with an openness um, in this orientation to be affected by a moment in inquiry, this openness isn't, um, isn't emptiness, and it doesn't mean that we're beginning with nothing. 
So we're aiming for an orientation of looking with rather than looking at. So this is very much an interpretive stance rather than an objective view. Um, so when we're trying to look alongside something um, in a looking with lens, we're trying to create a relation with what it is that's being photographed. So not merely looking at or capturing something in its entirety to represent its full meaning, but rather um, thinking about it in a way that is interpretive and represents uh, something in a way that is particularly um, specific, but also unfamiliar. So thinking about your drawings um, from the first week of, or first, I think it was the second week of classes, um, think about the paradigms of the scientific and the interpretive teacher researcher, and what kind of photo might an interpretive researcher seek to think with? 